what a fantastic episode, boy. So many great things happened, but uh, none was more shocking to me than the revelation between Liza Aaron and Peter Baelish. Game of Thrones, Season 4, Episode 5, first of his name. <laughs> oh, it just better and better with each episode. Well, hello, my brothers and sisters and Baratheons and Targaryens and Lannisters and Starks of the Nerd Nation. I, as always, am Jim, here to bring you another review on just the awesome and tantalizing, the gripping show that is HBO's Game of Thrones. Now, uh, the previous episode, of course, as everything's been chugging along, we've had several um, several really kind of bombshell watershed moments, and, and I try to go through these and try to cover the major points. Episodes are broken up differently. Sometimes there's more plot lines that are developing. Sometimes there's less. Uh, we had a number of different plot lines developing in this episode, and uh, and I'm really going to try to just tackle it um, by by the locations that the actual uh, plots took took place in because we start out and really the episode uh, with the episode name and that's that's first of his name and really uh, Tommen who's probably about 12 years old is uh, is being crowned of course king uh, king of Westeros and they have their ceremony and everything else. And what was done very well is that we know in last episode, Marjorie uh, Tyrell, you know, had kind of came to him in his bedchamber and gave him a little something to have wet dreams about at night. <laughs> and, uh, and she's kind of, you know, waving to him and smiling at him a little bit over from the side. And Cersei goes and all of a sudden steps in front. And we know Cersei's just like the evil queen bee bitch, you know. And she's, she's getting to this point where now she's not only lost a child, but she's just losing her grip on everything. Uh, she doesn't, she's in danger of not having any power anymore, you know. So there's a number of different cool things to be said there. But anyway, there was a very, very tense scene that I thought it was gr just expertly done, though, where Cersei winds up going over and talking to Marjorie, And, you know... Uh, the, the, Marjorie hopes to marry Tommen, right? That that's what. But but they need to still go through the proper channels and kind of have everybody give it their blessing and they're okay and what have you. So it, this is all part of the Game of Thrones and how everything's played. You know, Cersei realizes that her grip on Tommen is only going to last for so long, and that he's actually a, a good person, unlike Joffrey. And the revelation for me in this conversation was that <clears throat> Cersei went and said, and she was like, you know, things that Joffrey did shocked me. And then she asked Marjorie, she said, do I look like somebody who's easily shocked? And Marjorie says, no, your grace. And that's because Cersei has seen some shit, right, throughout her time. Cersei has, has been involved in everything from, you know, murder to incest and, and everything in between. So for Joffrey to have just freaked her out several times and have her question like, oh my God, what did I, what did I birth, you know? Uh, was but but to have her come to the realization of it that really Joffrey, although she still loved him, it was her firstborn, everything else, really Joffrey was not made for this world, and and, and that's kind of the real realization that she came to through talking with Marjorie. Now she hates Marjorie uh, in every sense of the word. She's younger, she's prettier, she's gonna of course she was you know poised to be the next heir to the throne as far well not heir to the throne but queen you know queen. Um, obviously with, you know, marrying Joffrey and everything else. And, and now the, the, the marriage to hopefully marriage to Tommen, but she winds up going and relinquishing a little bit of that and realizing that it's, it's good to, uh, to keep your friends close, but your enemies closer, you know? Um, and, and I think she realizes that Marjorie is going to be here to stay and that the smartest thing to do is to get things moving for the family, for the Lannister legacy with the Tyrells, right? So she's finally kind of come to that realization. So she has this tense conversation with Marjorie where she talks about, you know, uh, maybe would she consider marrying Tommen, you know? And Marjorie just plays it perfect. You got to play the game. Remember, it's all a game. And she's like, oh my God, I couldn't even, I honestly, I haven't, I haven't even gotten over the tragedy of losing my husband, you know, yet. Because she's got to play the game, man. Even though she didn't give two shits about Joffrey, she only cared about being queen. She's got to play it up for the, you know, for any, any, any eyes or ears, you know, anybody who's watching or listening. And you can see Cersei just kind of like smirk a little bit like, yeah, I get what you're doing. Uh, and then she's, and she goes and she says, I'll have to talk to my father about it and this and that and everything else, you know. And um, and it was really just great because then Cersei's like, yeah, I'll talk to mine as well. Because we all know Tywin's running the show. <laughs> you know what I mean? He's he's the hand of the king. Um, but he also, you know, has already taken Tommen under his wing. And, you know, and he's trying to exploit the good nature that, that, that the child has within him. And I also thought it was touching to go and see about how... Um, you know, Cersei winds up going and, and pretty much uh, demonizing Joffrey for what he was and everything else. 
and then goes and says that you know Tommen is good, he's pure of heart, he's a, he's a kind person, and that it may be the first king to sit on the throne in 50 years that actually deserves the crown, that actually does what a king should do, or actually has some of the good qualities that you'd look for uh, in a king, you know what I mean, for, for obviously those that are being ruled uh, underneath them in a kingdom. So it was really cool to see that and just to see that the whole scene was portrayed and just done very well. And, you know, honestly, hats off to the actors, the actresses in here. They've got some big names. They've got some no names. But really, everybody has just has just risen to the occasion. And this season especially, but there is just so many conversations that remind me of, like, just great Quentin Tarantino-type movies like Pulp Fiction or Reservoir Dogs where they just – it's it doesn't matter what's going on as far as the action and everything else. It's, it's what's coming out of the actors' mouths, and it's the words they're using and how they play off each other. Just done so well. So Cersei, though, this is all her major, her, her big plan, because she still has it out for trying to kill her brother Tyrion, right? So then there's another scene uh, that, that takes place, and again, I'm doing them by the location, not as, because scenes flop back and forth, and there was a couple of them that went, you know, and you saw at the beginning, and then towards the middle, and so King's Landing. So then there's a great conversation as well between Cersei and Tywin, where she goes and, and proposes that whole, you know, marriage to him and everything else. And he says, and he agrees to it and says, okay, and when will they consummate it? And well, when he's old enough and, you know, when will they get married in a fortnight, you know? And then he asks about her marriage to Loras, you know, because obviously he wants to go and kind of uh, cement, uh, cement the relationship between the Lannisters or the Baratheons and the Tyrells but also to go and put a, put some of the disgusting rumors about her and Jamie aside. Like, hey, listen, she married Loras, you know. But everybody knows Loras plays for the other team, so it's kind of odd. Uh, nonetheless, though, the conversation, that the, what, the piece that I took from the conversation that was great is that Cersei was trying to manipulate Tywin as being one of the judges that's actually going to judge over this trial uh, that, that, Tyr that for Tyrion, for the, the apparent murder of Joffrey, right? And she's trying to go and sway him, and he won't discuss any of the details of the trial with her, but she's trying to sway him by also, and then by also, not with just her words, but also her actions. The whole, I'm, I'll marry Loras, we have to do everything that's best for the realm. And then we find out that the Lannisters aren't really as wealthy as everybody thinks. The Lannisters, all their wealth has come from anybody who's read some of the history and things like that, is that Castle Rock is actually built on top of, and there's several gold and silver mines that are, are below it. Well, he asks Cersei how much, if she thinks, if she knows how much gold has been mined there in the past year. And she says, ounces, tons, what? He says, it doesn't matter what, you what, the, the answer is the same. None. Zero. A goose egg. Their mines haven't produced anything in three years, right? So she says, well, how is everything still, you know, going on about it? Well, what it is, is it's all about acting as if. It's working off of credit, and it's still having to go and provide that whole... War is expensive, first of all. And you got to remember that the Lannisters assembled and, and came together with all their bannermen and everything like that, and, and have gone on for a couple years now with this war uh, that just recently, of course, after the Red Wedding was declared to be done. But they explain about how the Iron Bank of Bravos, uh, the crown owes millions and millions of... of gold you know millions and millions to the to the iron bank of bravos and it's not it's not the type of thing you can scheme and manipulate or you can get like a, an iou or like a you have to pay you pay or it's very bad you know for the kingdom so we find out more about that but we also find out that this union between this uh this uh, the marriages and everything the arranged stuff between the tyrells and of course uh you know tom and the, the baratheon technically baratheon lannister or whatever is important because the tyrells are actually the wealthiest family right now in the Seven Kingdoms. They don't know they're the wealthiest family, though. And that's what I love about this whole just Game of Thrones type deal. The Lannisters are still acting as if, right? But they're in total debt, owe all kinds of money to all kinds of people, kind of living off a of credit type of thing, living beyond their means. But they have to do it to go and show that they're still the, the most wealthy, most powerful family in all the Seven Kingdoms, right? So I really loved how this was explained and everything and about how they owe millions to the Iron Bank and how they need this union between the Tyrells and whatnot. So they can that'll actually help take some of the burden and shift it off. So, all right, anyway, but enough about that. So then we get Cersei. Cersei goes and we wind up seeing Prince Oberyn. And I really like this guy. I don't know what it is about him. I like the guy. You know what I mean? He's, uh, for the most part, whenever we see him, he's in some kind of brothel and some sort of sexual type of thing. That has nothing to do with why I like him. I just think the dude is slick. I think the actor is great. I think he delivers great lines. I think his accent is, is on, on point. So anyway, he's one of the other judges, right, for Tyrion's, Tyrion's upcoming trial. So Cersei has to go and get her claws into him and asks him to go walk through the royal gardens. And as they go, and the shots were just great, the way they had these tracking shots as they were walking through the gardens. 
and she's talking to him and, and she, what she does is she's playing on his heartstrings, right? She talks about how her daughter got sent away, you know, which to, to Dorne, obviously. And, uh, and he says he has eight daughters and everything else. And she talks to him about that. And she plays on his family side of things, right? Uh, it tugs on his heartstrings as far as that goes. Because, you know, and then she talks about how, you know, losing her firstborn son, Joffrey. And then, of course, uh, you know, then, of course, her daughter being sent away a year ago. She hasn't seen her in over a year. All, you know, and, and what, what, I, what I think she's trying to do, well, what I know she's trying to do, she's trying to manipulate and sway his opinion and his vote, being that he's a family man, that he has kids himself. Kind of like, hey, Tyrion has to answer for this. He took one of my children from me. You know, how would you feel if something like that happened to you? And then there's also this moment where they get out to the bay and she asks if he can uh, if he can bring back a, a gift for that she's had the shipwrights working on this beautiful sailboat, um, you know, for her. Uh, for for her daughter and what have you, so it was it was done very well because the way she goes and gets her hooks into people, and manipulates them, it's it's just amazing. And you actually, it's funny because as much as I hate Cersei for some of the things she did, this show is so good at making you also feel for a person as well. Because I also feel for her struggle and I feel for uh, you know her arranged marriage to Robert and all the bullshit that she's had to go through just because her last name was Lannister and all the things she had to go through to become the queen. And maybe she didn't even want it to begin with, right? The whole point was is that she was kind of sold off almost into slavery or pushed off into an arranged marriage, as many things like that happen in, in, the, in the Seven Kingdoms. And there was a lot of bad things that were attached to it, you know? Now, don't get me wrong, it isn't like she's a good person for going and being a brother fucker and sleeping with Jamie and everything else and having, you know, Ill illegitimate bastard children with him and all that stuff, incestual children. I'm not saying any of that's good, but I'm just saying that it actually makes you feel for her, you know? So just bravo, hats off to them. Done very, very well, I thought. So the next location that we kind of deal with, and this was um, a small part that we wound up dealing with, but but I, I like seeing Daenerys. Whenever I see her on screen, I like her. I like what she does. I like what she brings uh, to the table. I didn't care for her much in season two because she seemed very whiny and, and entitled, uh, but I've, I've liked her very much, her character and what she represents and stands for throughout the whole series, but especially last season into this season. So we wind up coming to find out that uh, now, of course, she's taken over Marine. And um, and that in addition to what I don't get is she's got 8,000 Unsullied. She's got 2,000 of the Second Sons with her, right? So she's got 10,000 fighting force. But every city she's gone and taken over and freed slaves, they don't just all run off. I'm sure some of them have to join up with her and follow her. So I don't know if those ones are, you know, they just kind of relegate them to like, you know, cooks and supply wagon type people to kind of keep the, the soldiers fed. But whenever they talk about numbers, they never talk about their numbers having increased as she's gone through Slaver Bay and pretty much taken down every city on the way there. What we do find is that she has to make uh, her first difficult choice. She can go and, and uh, Dario has uh, Dario Naharis has, has captured the 93 or 94 ships that they have in, in Slaver Bay. They're in Marine. And they can carry about, about you know, 9,000, 10,000 troops over with them. And they can go, they can raid King's Landing, right? They can go try to sack King's Landing. And she asks uh, Jorah, she says, well, can, you know, can we? And he says, well, you may be able to. But the thing about it is we're not, you're not trying to take King's Landing. Once you take King's Landing, 10,000 is not going to be nearly enough to go and to take over anybody else that tries to fight back in the Seven Kingdoms. And she says, well, a lot of people support my claim. He says, no, what's, what's ultimately going to happen is bannermen for whatever houses, they're going to do what they've always done. They're going to support whoever they think actually is going to win the war. So ones that think that she's just an upstart and doesn't, and, and it's just a little uprising and it'll be over, it'll be a little rebellion that'll be quelled, they'll go and side with whoever's in power, whoever is convenient for them. So it's really all about, it's not about loyalty, it's all about people just kind of playing the hand they're dealt and just trying to do the best they can and make a bad situation, you know, uh, in, into something good or livable. So the neat thing was as though there was that choice or he reports to her that uh, the cities that she's taken over and left, one of them, uh, you know, the, the, the slavers have come back and now they've, they've put people back in chains and they've swore to have vengeance upon her, probably hurting and killing these slaves as well to try to get her attention. Um, you know, and then another, the, the, the last one that she took on, um, you know, she wound up, uh, I, I, some guy named Cleon the Butcher took, took over and, you know, went, uh, basically took the, uh, the council that she put in place, pretty much took them out, killed them, whatever, and took over. And what, what it showed us is that 
you can have great intentions. You can go through and you can free these people, you can free these people, but if they have never known freedom and they don't have the proper infrastructure, the systems and controls that you need in place to make something run, to make a kingdom, to make a city, to make it run, then really it's going to leave it open to temptation. It's going to leave it open to the bad element. It's going to leave it open to opportunistic type of people. There's going to be people that are going to see everything in chaos and say, hey, the powers that be have been taken out now. I can be the new powers that be, right? So that's very much what it teaches you in here. And she has this difficult choice of being able to raid Westeros and possibly be able to take King's Landing and push through and, and get her claim and her birthright and everything else, right, as a Targaryen sitting on the throne again of Westeros. Or she can go and try to fix the issues that have happened in Slaver's Bay. And what I like is that the choice that she makes is that, you know what, I'm, I'm going to be patient. I'm not going to be rash and hasty. I'm not going to go to Westeros and maybe lose, maybe win, whatever, right? If I can't go and if I can't rule over this these these couple of cities that I've taken over in this on this smaller scale, how the hell am I going to rule seven kingdoms? And that's really what I liked about her and I liked about her character. She's young and she's naive in a lot of senses, but she's been faced with adversity and this was her first real true test of like what should I do here, you know? And I think she made the right choice for right now. So although it really would have been cool to see a nice raiding on King's Landing with 10,000 men and ships and three dragons, I think that'll eventually happen. So uh, nonetheless, though, very, very good stuff. Now, one of the other locations that I thought was great that we saw was uh, we, we wind up seeing uh, just kind of on the road to the wall. We see Paldrick and Brienne of Tarth. And this was really more for comic relief than anything, I thought. Paldrick is not really a very good squire. Squiring for Tyrion is really more not really like a squire. It's really more just like an errand boy. You know, he fixed his meals, sent his messages, kind of wiped his ass type of things, right? Never really did anything. He can't even ride a horse properly. <laughs> And Brienne's riding on her horse, and his horse is going to the left and to the right and in front of her. And it's just comical to watch the whole thing take place. But what I really liked about it is, number one, I really like these two characters. I think it's a great, great dynamic duo team up, and I hope to see more from them. But as they sit down, and he's, he can't even cook a rabbit, right? You know, she obviously had went and killed a rabbit. Maybe he killed it. I don't know. But he's cooking the thing, and he hasn't even skinned it. It starts on fire. The fur's on fire. He's stomping it out. She comes back with some firewood, and Brienne of Tarth is just like, what in the hell? What? Can't you just leave? I release you from your oath, you know? And he doesn't care. He's, he's still loyal. And I like Paldrick. I love the guy. Um, just the character, you know? Just kind of, he has this he has this sort of simple charm to him, you know? But anyway, we wind up finding out, and it's in a very touching uh, manner. She says, you know, how did you get to be this and that? What did you do? Have you ever killed anybody? And he says, yes, I did. And he explains in the Battle of Blackwater how he put a spear through the back of the head of one of the Kingsguard that tried to kill <clears throat> Tyrion. And I think after that, Brienne has a little bit of respect for him, you know. I think that she looks at him, and I don't know if it's so much that she pities him, um, but I think that's that she looks at him and she thinks, you know what, he's been through some stuff, and he's risen to the occasion when he needed to. And ultimately, he did the honorable thing and protected his master, Tyrion, right? And, uh, you know, so I, I think that that's where that comes from because the Kingsguard are not, you know, they're obviously they're fully armored, they're trained, you know, they're not, they're not to be trifled with. And here the squire took one of them out. And even though it was a spear to the back of the head, he didn't see it coming, it was still the point, you know, it was done very well. So um, I really liked the, uh, the, the scene. And then she goes and, you know, says, reluctantly tells me he can come over and help her unstrap her armor because she's having trouble with it. So very, very good stuff with that scene as well. I liked it. Um, the next scene that we went on to that I thought was kind of cool was uh, we saw, and it was a couple of scenes, but again, just the location is, of course, on the way to the Erie, uh, on the way to the Vale, I guess you would say, uh, to the Erie, is, um, is Arya and the Hound. And these two are just great together. I mean, the chemistry they have is great. Maisie Williams, uh, or Maze, however you pronounce her name, uh, the actress that plays Arya, is just, just wonderful. And um, and you see these two it, it, at first. The first scene is they're at night, and they're you know uh, she's she's reciting her her little thing at night that she does where she says everybody's name that she's gonna kill, and he's just like, "Will you fucking stop it?" You know, <laughs> and it's just really there for comic relief. I thought, but um, anyway, so she goes, "It's okay." And they have this big conversation. And then at the end, she says, "It's all right. I only have one more name anyway." And then she turns her back and she says, "The Hound." You know, <laughs> so obviously there's no love loss between them. She's still pretty pissed off at him. But we wind up seeing the next morning in the next scene when it cuts back to them that she's gone. And he like gets up and freaks out, of course. That's his meal ticket, right? And he goes and he winds up finding her. She's actually practicing her sword, water, dancing stuff that Sirio taught her back in the first uh, in the first season, you know. And she's doing this and she's it's pretty impressive, the moves that she's got, man. Girl's got some hops, dude. She's doing flips with the sword and everything like that, doing handstands and cartwheels and stuff. And anyway, what he winds up doing is he says, he, he basically goes and has this conversation with her and explain, like makes fun of the, the fighting style to begin with of, of that, the swordsman of Bravos, right? 
And then he goes and he's like, yeah, go ahead, see, show me what you can do. So she goes and does this move and then it goes to stab him and pins him with, you know, hit him with needle. And it goes and it sticks into his chain mail as a small sword would that you go to stab with. That's what the chain mail is made for. When something goes to pierce and push into it, the chain mail constricts and actually becomes stronger the way it, the way it pushes inward. Um, you know, obviously having full armor has its advantages, you know, so it had disadvantages too weighing you down. But it's great because he goes and just <laughs> backhands her, knocks her to the ground. <laughs> he goes, and the reason that your greatest swordsman teacher is dead or whatever <laughs> is because, is because, and he explains how Marin Trench or whatever, the guy who, uh, the, the, the King's Guard or whatever that wound up killing him, said because he had armor and a big fucking sword. <laughs> and it was just so great how it was done. Because it's very much like... He's almost like schooling her in the way of the real world, right? She grew up sheltered as as the daughter of a lord, you know, as the, uh, the daughter of the Lord of Winterfell. And then even when she was in King's Landing, very sheltered, living within the Red Keep, within the palace. Uh, you know, of course, uh, just some of the different things that she's seen in, 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 prior to being out on the road the last couple of uh, seasons. Now, those things that was before, she was very sheltered, you know, whereas now... Um, she's obviously seen and done some things, you know, but, uh, the hound keeps grounding her and bringing her back to reality. Like, listen, it's not all about just dancing around and this and that, like, this is the reality of it. Okay. If you have somebody with a big sword knows how to use it and armor, they're going to take you and your little, your little pig sticker out, you know? <laughs> so I thought it was done very, very well. Now for me, the most interesting part of, as, as a, as a growing fan of the mythos and the characters, the background, the history of Westeros and just how everything's come to be. And I've been learning and studying up on the history and the families and the locations and everything. And I really, really am excited and, and love to, to go and obviously share some of that knowledge with others, talk with you. But the thing that really got me was, um, and it was done through a couple of different scenes, was uh, Sansa and Littlefinger uh, actually you know, getting off the boat and arriving uh, you know, at, at the Erie. We didn't really find out much in the first season about the Eyrie. We heard that it was this impregnable, impenetrable fortress, right? And we actually see when her and Peter Baelish, Sansa and Peter Baelish, are walking up that there's this narrow gorge and it's the only way in, right? And they have, you know, people, par archers and such, soldiers posted up on there. And he explained that in the thousand years that this fortress has been there, um, it, it's, never, it's never been breached. And because of the way it's set up like it is, there's only this one way that would have to funnel people in three or four wide and they would just get slaughtered. So nobody has ever been able to mount a successful invasion on the Erie, right? So I thought that was cool because I like that type of stuff. I like finding out about that and just like the whole engineering, you know, feats and what have you. And then, of course, just using the natural terrain to their advantage. And, um, and, and it also goes to show, and it's a nice metaphor for what Peter Baelish winds up saying, and he says... Something he says when you when you have something like this set up, one man can be worth ten thousand. And what he means by that is that if you had a few hundred good soldiers, they could hold off against hundreds of thousands because of this being this this bottleneck way, and there, there's no other way to mount an assault on it, right? And but it was also a metaphor. It, it was a metaphor for what he's done. One man, right, that came from nothing, that really just kind of had a grudge against everybody wealthier and richer than him and whatnot has manipulated pretty much every major power and major family in Westeros. And we find out very shortly after, in the next scene uh, with Liza Aaron, has pretty much orchestrated every major event, uh, at least in Westeros, up until this point, you know, or had a hand in it, right? And that's what really dropped the bomb for me. I knew this guy was sharp, whether you love him or hate him, I don't care. I think the guy is, uh, I, think he's, I think he's a genius the way he's put everything together. We know that he had a hand in and set everything up with uh, Olena Tyrell now, obviously, um, you know, for, for the, the murder of King Joffrey. But the thing that was great is that when they actually get to the Eyrie, right, uh, to the fortress, and they go in, and, uh, and Liza Aaron, we see her again. We haven't seen her since the first season. If you remember, he was going to go, he was sent to the Eyrie uh, to go and kind of like court Liza Aaron. And, and now that he's the, um, now that he's been given Harem Hall and he's a lord and he has some titles to go and strengthen the kingdom and bring the veil back into the fold. Because since her husband, John Aaron, was poisoned or was killed, right? Um, she's just, the, the veil has wanted to have nothing to do with, with King's Landing. And they pretty much, they can do whatever they want because of how they're segregated in this fortress, right? So his whole thought was, you know, or his whole goal was to bring them back in. That's what you thought. We find out after the introductions between her and Sansa, who she had never met but knew what she looked like, and Sansa goes off to do stuff. She goes and all of a sudden gets like to five, like stage five clinger craziness, right? And she grabs Peter and she's like, and we're going to get married tonight and this and that. And you're going to fuck me so hard and I'm going to scream and blah, blah, blah. 
and he's kind of trying to put her off and everything else. But then the bomb that was dropped for me was then she goes and we, we find out, <laughs> we find out that her marriage to John Eric, she's always lived in the shadow of her sister, Caitlin, anyway, Caitlin, who was more beautiful than her and blah, 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 and everything else, right? And Baelish, Peter Baelish always wanted Caitlin and this and that, but we find out that they've been fucking for years, that they've been hooked up for years, right? Like, even while she was married to John Aaron. We also find out in what I thought was a bombshell that she is the one, he gave her the poison that she put into his wine glass to poison and kill her own husband, John Aaron, right? And she went and then, of course, wrote the letter at his behest to send to Catelyn Stark saying, I think John Aaron was poisoned by the Lannisters. So when you go and you look at it and you take everything back, that's the pilot episode of the first season. The only reason Ned wound up agreeing to be Hand of the King and everything else was because his friend and mentor John Aaron had been killed, but under mysterious circumstances that we found out from the letter from Liza and Catelyn say it was there was something that was like Ned needed to go investigate, right? And that's what set the whole thing in motion. Now, obviously him finding out what happened and finding out what John Aaron had to. And up until now, I thought that the Lannister, Cersei in particular, or Jamie, had poisoned, right? Had poisoned him. And uh, apparently it was just a fortunate turn of events for them that, that it never came out what he actually knew about them. But the point is, is that Littlefinger's the one that freaking did everything. He's the one who started all this stuff. He's put everything in motion. And between that and the killing of King Joffrey and everything in between, driving the crown into bankruptcy, into debt, and everything else... This motherfucker has just he's just feeding off of the chaos and nobody's looking at him for that. He's building allies in places, but he's I love the just the 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 mystery and, and everything that, that surrounds him. Now some of it's come now some of the lipstick has come off the pig. But for the most part, man, we just we were thinking, are you kidding me? We thought this was all this arrangement. No, yeah, he's arranging everything. He's brought Sansa there to Liza and everything else. But the bottom line is he orchestrated every major event that wound up leading us up to this point to begin with, you know? So, and there's certain things he couldn't have atoned for. He didn't know that Joffrey, of course, would go and wind up uh, killing and beheading Ned Stark. I'm sure that he didn't know that the Red Wedding was going to take place like it did and everything. He loved Catelyn very much. But the point is, is that he's been playing everybody from the start. And, I mean, he's had this shit going with Liza for years on the side, right? And she never liked her marriage to John Aaron. I'm sure it was arranged and he was older and all this other bullshit, you know. But the bottom line is this dude is one sneaky... And I said it a couple episodes ago. This is the guy to watch out for. He's dangerous. He's very dangerous, right? So anyway, then we go and I love it because at the end of it when he agrees to marry her and everything else that night, you know, and to get married, they've been waiting so long and blah, blah. And she's like, oh, and you're going to fuck me so hard. I'm going to scream and this and that. And then this was comic relief for me, right? Later on that night, the very next scene you hear... Oh, oh. <laughs> I was actually going to try to find the clip and see if I could cut it in <laughs> and then come back after every couple seconds and be like, really? <laughs> because she, <laughs> he's, he's nailing her obviously somewhere in the, in the eerie and Sansa, poor Sansa, who's been through so much is just laying there in the bed, right? By can and there's a bunch of candles up by her and she's just sitting there like, oh my God, do I really have to hear like Peter going and banging my aunt, you know? <laughs> At this point, she's probably thinking, man, Tyrion and King's Landing wasn't so bad, especially now that Joffrey'd be gone. <laughs> Poor Sansa, man, just, you know, <laughs> just piled on the girl. So then, uh, and, and this comes back to the scene later on, but same location, obviously, in the Eyrie, we see, again, how Liza's this crazy five-stage clinger, and she actually sits down and starts having this heart to -heart conversation with Sansa, telling her about her sister, Catelyn, and about this and about that. And you find out that she's always kind of lived in the shadow of her, she always felt like she was like the third wheel or like the second daughter type of thing. And she was in a lot of ways. But she also goes and just goes completely fucking batshit crazy and grabs onto Sansa and starts digging into her hands and accusing Sansa of basically being a whore and letting Peter go and, and bang her. She's so insecure because Peter... Her for, if Peter's first choice, of course, was Catelyn, her sister, who's now dead. And she figures that, you know, she just looks at Sansa as like another pretty Tully girl, you know, another another Catelyn Tully, you know, it's, it's her daughter. Why wouldn't Peter want to bang her? Why didn't he bang her on the way over? And I mean, she flips and Sansa's like in tears crying. Sansa's probably just thinking, oh my God, things have gone from bad to worse, man. I thought it was bad living in the, in the Red Keep and Joffrey and his craziness, but now this is what my aunt does to me? What the fuck? So then at the end of it, she's like, oh, it's okay, it's okay. And she comes out of like psycho rage mode thing. But what this shows you is how smart Peter Baelish is too. 
This guy went and found somebody that he could manipulate, somebody who was emotionally weak and distraught that he could manipulate and play off of her and use it to his advantage to gain more power amongst the chaos. Love it. Just beautiful, you know. So anyway, for me, that was that was the, the crowning moment of the episode. But then the episode actually got better in a lot of ways because for those of you out there that were like, well, there wasn't much action, right? There wasn't much action. The last scene takes us up north to Caster's Keep, right? Or, I'm sorry, Craster's Keep? Was it Craster's Keep, I believe it was? And, uh, and that, <coughs> excuse me, and, uh, and the mutineers that are up there, right? That guy Locke, who works for Roos Bolton and was sent up there, obviously, to find out about, um, you know, about the Starks to see if he gets some information from Jon Snow or find out about Bran and Rickon. He goes and scouts out the area and finds like the the, the, the shed, the hut, whatever uh, that Jojen and Mira and Hodor and uh, and of course Bran are being kept uh, captive in. Right. He then comes back and reports to everybody that hey, there's eleven of them. They're drunk, this and that. But there's this area off on the west side of the camp that we shouldn't go into because there's dogs there, there's hounds, and we don't want to alert them. We want to be quiet and stealthy, right? So he goes and keeps them away because, you know, he's got to get Bran, you know what I mean? He's got to make sure that there's no Starks, to, there's no heirs to Winterfell because his boss, Roose Bolton, promised him, you know, 100 acres and a hold fast and all this other stuff, right? So he wants to get that. And then, of course, Roose, once he goes and takes care of the Iron Islanders, uh, he can, can wind up being the Lord of Winterfell, Lord of the North, you know, if there's no Starks left uh, that, can, that can take it over. So anyway, so they wind up coming in and instead of going and coming in, uh, you know, uh, silent and taking out as many of these drunk bastards as they can. They come in just, you know, guns blazing or whatever, swords a blazing. But prior to that, there's just this really creepy thing where they're going to go in and they're going to rape this Mira. And, you know, I thought about it and I'm like, you know, is there anybody who isn't in this, in this show who isn't trying to cut somebody's dick off or trying to rape somebody or trying to just bang somebody that they shouldn't be against their will? It seems like that's like the theme for the whole show is like rape, incest, and just like forcing people upon other people sexually, you know, whether it's men on men, women on women, or a combination thereof. Uh, it's... It, it's a little disturbing sometimes, but anyway, it winds up not actually getting to the point where there's a uh, where where he winds up. He's, his intention is to rape her, but that Jojen winds up going and he said tells him that he has the sight, he can see you know into the future. And this guy says, "Oh, well, can you see what I'm going to do raping your sister? And can you see them raping her?" And he goes, "No, but I see you dead." And I see you burning, you know. And right as that happens, all of a sudden, you know, there you know somebody's like, "Oh man, you know the the the, the, the Night's Watch are back. They're back for us," you know. So in this in this kind of awkward scene, you see the Night's Watch charging in and trying to fight these guys, and Jon Snow, of course, being all valiant and killing a bunch of people. And this guy has to go, of course, take off the uh, you know the the, the, the leader of the, the mutineers, and uh, and you know the shit's going to go down with that. But anyway, what winds up happening is then we get uh, that guy Locke winds up coming in, who's obviously the spy for for Roose, and he goes and frees Bran. Uh, but then goes and tells everybody that you know he'll he'll slit he'll slit uh, slit everybody's throat if he doesn't come with him and be quiet and he's gonna take him right. So he goes and throws Bran over his shoulder and goes running out into the you know try to take off with him you know. And I thought this was great. Bran winds up going. This is the first time we've actually seen a really cool use of of his power of his being able to ward people. I mean, he did it before to calm Hodor down. He did it for a couple other things, but this was cool. I thought. He winds up going and, and getting into Hodor's mind, and Hodor actually is able to break free with his immense strength. He's this giant, and he comes running after him and winds up going and tackling him and then grabbing this guy and holding him up by his neck, this guy Locke. And I kind of like this guy Locke. I thought he would have been a better character to maybe be portrayed a little further in this whole spy amongst the, the Night's Watch and everything like that. But uh-uh, ain't gonna happen. It's Game of Thrones because Hodor just goes and, you know, through, well, obviously, Bran in Hodor's mind, winds up snapping this dude's neck and dropping him to the ground. And then what winds up happening after that, to me, really pissed me off. I understand from the book readers that this this diverged to begin with from the book, uh, but the books, but I don't really care about that because I don't read the books, not to mention I'm not a person who believes that it has to be 100% perfectly translated from book to to show, I believe that there should be some uh, there should be some extra added things that are put in there. There should be some deviations uh, because who wants to go and read something and then see the exact same thing on TV anyway? I know not me, not many people either. But there's so many complainers out there that the book deviates and everything else. That is, uh, fortunately though, that's not the point. The book readers, I guess, will be happy because everything at the end here got back on track because all this shit technically didn't happen in the uh, in the book. So. Bran is right there, right? And, and you got to feel bad for the Starks because all the Stark children, in addition to losing their mother and father and eldest brother and everything else, they've all been separated, right? I mean, Bran and Rickon were together for the majority of season three, but they've been separated now for a while. 
And he goes and he sees his brother, his bastard brother, Jon Snow, and wants to go to him, right? And this little batshit ass white bastard Jojen goes and he's like, oh, well, but we got to go. John will try to stop us and we got to go to the magical tree where we have the visions to see the three-eyed raven, you know. And, you know, John, first of all, you got to give John a little more credit than that, okay? If John knew how important it was and Bran and Jojen and everything explained it to him, explained what has happened and blah, blah, and everything else... Who knows what John would do? Now, I know that this that this would deviate from the book, so the book readers would be angry. But to me, having them that close to each other and then having him, Bran have to make the terrible choice of just maybe never seeing my brother again, this isn't like the modern times. You can't text him or send him a card to see how he's doing at the wall. You may never see that dude again. It takes months to travel from one area to another because of just the danger and the hundreds of miles. and the, You know what I mean? And Bran is a cripple. He can't even walk now, you know? So... Anyway, they wind up going off into the forest and go back on their journey. Everything's happy with the book people because now they're back on their journey, I guess, wherever Bran, wherever that takes Bran and Hodor and Jojen and Mira. And Jon Snow winds up having a, a final battle uh, with, uh, you know, with, with this, with this asswipe uh, mutineer at, at Craster's Keep. And it was it was done pretty well. Uh, the guy clearly had the upper hand on Jon Snow because he kind of he fights you know he fights with honor. He fights fair. He fights like he was taught you know as, as even though he's a bastard son, still as a son of a lord you know. And this dude fights like with ferocity and just to win you know. It doesn't matter if it's cheap or whatever. He's got you know he's wielding two swords you know. Anyways, as it looks like Jon Jon Snow already gets stabbed after he got shot with three arrows at the end of last season by Egret. So John's getting all sorts of messed up, and it looks like he's going to wind up, he's, there's not going to be any more John Snow, right? And which is a shame, because I like him. And then uh, one of uh, Craster's daughters, wives, whatever the hell they were, winds up going and, uh, and getting his attention, you know, winds up, uh, you know, distracting him, hitting him, whatever. And as he winds up going and turning to go get her, and he's going to rape her before he, and, and these, these people, this mutineer thing was so stupid anyway, you know, these guys want to go live north of the wall just so they can drink and rape people all day long. That's just, again, the theme of rape, right? So anyway, but at the end, it was nice and satisfying because all of a sudden, through the back of his head comes Jon Snow's sword from an upward, from, from a downward angle. So it winds up coming out the front of his head and face like this, you know, and then he pulls it out and the dude, look, look on his face as he just like fell pretty much right next to her was, was great. The episode winds up ending with, uh, you know, Jon Snow and uh, they wind up losing, Jon and uh, I think there was, there was 10 or 11 of them. So I don't know how many of the, the brothers were. They wind up losing four though of the Night's Watch, four, bro four brothers of the Night's Watch. And then they go and they they you know, he makes this speech to the women of Craster's Keep and says, hey, you can come with us. We'll find you jobs. We'll find you work. And they basically just said, you know what? It doesn't matter. You know, I mean, we'll wind up getting hurt and beat and raped by the Night's Watch people somehow or another anyway. It's kind of one of those, like, it was almost like a feminist point of view, you know, like, oh, no matter what, everything's going to be terrible for us. So we'll just we'll just be better off on our own. And, uh, and then they tell him to burn, burn the place to the ground, burn everything to the ground. And that's how the, the episode ends a little bit abruptly with them just, you know, start setting everything and all the bodies, of course, on fire. And, uh, and, and then that's, that's how we're left off. Uh, obviously, next week's episode looks great. I'm very excited about it. All in all, though, for me, each week the episodes keep getting better. Uh, maybe it's because I'm delving into and finding out more about the history and lore and things like that. Um, but ultimately, I think it's just because it, it is so good. And, and, and as you get to know the characters better with each passing week, you feel excited to see them on screen, to see their, their stories progress. And so far, ever, in, in season three, there were several stories that I was kind of like, eh, I could do without that. I don't really want to see that. In this season, pretty much everything that I've seen, I've really enjoyed. Uh, the, 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 the sort of rapish scene between Jamie and Cersei, the way it was depicted, I think was handled wrong. And that was the only scene that really kind of made me feel uncomfortable because of how I've grown accustomed to and really liked Jamie as a character. And just because everybody told me that would, that's not how it was portrayed. That's not how it should be. That's one thing that I believe, uh, was just shot in the wrong way. But other than that minor, minor issue, I, I can't find any weaknesses or anything to complain about with this series, especially this season. So uh, definitely a great episode, you know, uh, a 9.5 out of 10 for me, whatever you want to say, you know, it was, it was great. Very, very good stuff. So my episode question for you though, brothers and sisters is what were your thoughts uh, on finding out about that Peter Baelish was behind everything? I mean, you know, everything from pretty much the start of this series, he's had some kind of hand in uh, every major event happening because I mean, it can really be said that the, the war was sparked obviously because of the thing with Ned Stark, went, but what did he really think was going to happen with you know of course ned was going to get involved in one way or another to find out what happened to his friend john aaron his mentor 
and eventually he was going to go and come to the truth, you know, and, you know, and Peter went and tried to go inside with Ned right before everything was going to happen after, you know, Robert was about to die and everything else. And Ned went and put his, his, his honor before actually doing the right thing and just, you know, just taking them out of power completely. Ned thought that a piece of paper written by Robert was going to protect him. And we saw how that worked out. Um, but ultimately, you know, Peter plays people off of each other. And I just want to know what your thoughts are on him as a character and just obviously all the plot devices that he has started throughout this series. So let me know your answer to that question in the comments down below. Feel free to hit the thumbs up, the like button if you should think that I deserve it. And uh, subscribe if you haven't done so already. We will look forward to catching all of you in the next fun nation. Don't forget to follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and my other channel as well.